Thursday, July 28. It's been a few months since we did one of these. Uh, I thought the song was appropriate. Staying alive. I don't know if they're talking about me. <laughs> um, contrary to rumors, uh, I am alive. Been under my desk, but I've been alive. Um, got a great show today. Michael Belkin, who's a dear friend and been in this uh, room many times, is going to grace us with his uh, insights. You know, I was thinking, and we'll get to Michael in a second. I just wanted to talk just for a couple minutes up front. Um, what a year it's been. What a market it's been. I certainly didn't uh, see this coming. I, it's hard for one to have gotten more wrong than I did, so mea culpa. You know, at the turn of the year, um, it's funny, I was looking back at forecasts, and I, I thought earnings would go down significantly, and we'd have a date with 3,000 on the S&P. And I looked at uh, a lot of the strategist forecasts, and they were similarly uh, negatively biased, looking for a lower market. But to be fair, um, you know, earnings have eroded, but they haven't imploded. I recall numbers of uh, 160, 180 in S&P earnings being thrown around. I think right now, I was listening to an Ed Hyman call earlier today, I believe we're running at $212 annualized, uh, down 7% versus the prior year, uh, second quarter of last year of 229. So earnings have eroded, but they have not uh, imploded. If someone had told me that you'd have a big increase in interest rates, mortgage rates, the cost of cap would be going up across the board. And we'd have a banking crisis on top of it and a real estate crisis. And the market would be up as much as it is this year. I <laughs> That would have been a tall order for me to believe. And I've, I've gotten it very wrong. So sorry for anyone who listened to me. Last year we got it very right. This year we've gotten it very wrong. Uh, the market itself, early in the year, as you all know, I don't want to engage in Captain Obvious talk, but market was very narrow, led by that Magnificent Seven. But more recently, it's been broadening out. Market breadth has improved. As one technician said to me the other day, if you didn't know any better and you just looked at what was going on in the market in terms of the market itself, the offensive leadership of the market, sickles outperforming, you'd think that we have a very strong economy. And uh, I think it was Stan Druckermiller or someone who once said that, you know, the, the stock market's the best forecaster of the economy. Um, earnings, as I said, have kind of, they've sagged but not imploded. You know, housing has held up relatively well, despite the big increase in interest rates. Uh, earnings, uh, I think the ECI came out of play, employment cost index. Uh, wage growth is slowing. I think the number this morning was 4.1% year on year. Atlanta Fed forecast still looking for an excess of 2% GDP. I think eventually this, this higher cost of capital will flow through, but it's not right here or it's doing it at a very slow pace. Many companies, you know, have locked in or refinanced at low interest rates as a lot of homeowners with uh, low cost mortgages. So the impact has been, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, as they say. And so it's a very confusing uh, environment right now. Um, you know, the negative side of the ledger, uh, market multiples expanded appreciably. Um, and the market looks pretty expensive, very expensive versus interest rates as the equity risk premium has collapsed to a level not seen for better part of 15 plus years. And we could discuss that later. What does that mean? Maybe an inflationary environment or the absence of a disinflationary environment, the equity risk premium deserves to be lower than it would have been otherwise. But the market's expensive. Um, earnings have been coming down. You know, the bulls have been hanging their hat on, well, there'll be rate cuts and you're going to get a second half acceleration. Well, to the contrary, um, <laughs> rate cuts are not in the offing and I think the Fed means business when they say higher for longer and then the question becomes can they pull off their much vaunted and hoped for uh, soft landing you know the US government has been spending money like a drunken sailor uh, the budget has just been blowing out uh, you can, you know, tons of fixed income supply coming you combine that with what's going on elsewhere in the world with central banks particularly the news last night about the Japanese maybe easing up on yield curve control. 
Um, John Roke, uh, I was listening to him this morning. He was saying if yields were a stock, you'd want to buy them. So a lot of confusing messages here. Uh, and I can't think of a better person to try to untangle this than Michael Belkin. Uh, Michael, I'm going to get you up here as a speaker now. And uh, Michael's always informative, always provocative. Uh, like all of us, doesn't get, always get it right. But um, he's had more than his fair share of good calls. Michael, I'm trying to connect you. Are you? There you go. Michael, where'd you go here? You just disappeared. Michael, try to come back up. I don't know what happened to you. There you are. And Matt, he was a speaker again. Twitter has been uh, very sketchy of late. Uh, for those of you who are wondering uh, what happened last week, we were supposed to have this space a week ago. Uh, yesterday, I believe it was. And someone had hacked into my Twitter account. I was locked out for a few days. It was bizarre because I was able to get in. Yeah, yeah we got you, Michael. Uh, yeah, yeah, Michael, can you hear me? Yeah, can Michael, you hear me? Yeah, can we you hear, hear me? Fine. Yeah, we hear okay. you fine. Just hold, just hold on, Michael. So okay, great. It was bizarre because the more, even as late as the morning of uh, the scheduled space, I was able to get into my Twitter account to put in updates and whatever. And then when it came time to start the space, someone had hacked it and I was locked out for a few days. So in case people are wondering what happened, um, I don't know who hacked into my account, but it is what it is. All right, Michael, good to see you. Um, it's been a few months since we've had you in here. So uh, the floor is yours. Why don't you just, I think people have a pretty good idea what you do. So um, maybe if you want to have a cursory review of what you do or how you do it, that's great. But um I don't think we need to go back, uh, you know, as in depth as, as you normally do. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Okay. Thanks for having me, George. Um, okay. So, quick review, like George said, um, I, I have a forecasting model developed uh, at UC Berkeley, and then at Solomon Brothers. Um, been using the same model for 35 years or something now. Uh, doing the Belkin Report for 31 years. Um, so what does the model do? It gives three things, direction, position, and intensity in a 12-period forecast. It's a form of time series analysis. I studied um, Fourier analysis and Box Jenkins ARIMA autoregressive integrated moving average models at Berkeley, and then I learned how to apply them in a unique way, S different model, same mathematics. Um, so anyways, direction, position, intensity, 12-period forecast. And I'm using weekly and monthly data. And uh, what does the model do? It gives direction, position, intensity. Direction, up, down, or neutral. Position, beginning, middle, end. And intensity, or confidence interval. So direction, position, intensity. <clears throat> and so you can see these things coming. And the, I'm looking for the strongest signals and how long they're going to last, where we are in the cycle. So that's it in a nutshell. Kind of, if you think of it like a baseball game, nine innings, you know, I have 12 innings in my forecast. So anyways, I, I, I'll throw out some forecasts here, and I'll tell you what part of the game we're in. You know, are we in the first inning, second inning, third inning, or are we in the 13th inning? Okay, so just to give a background, I was, I was really bullish beginning of the year, um, on, and FANG stocks were, you know, and tech stocks were my top long ideas from the model forecast back then, first quarter. That was goes back to October, actually. So uh, second, last quarter of 2022, first quarter, really build up. Uh, sec second quarter, which is June, um, April, May, June, uh, totally wrong. I, I switched. I covered all my longs. I said FANG is topping, you know, and ended up going much higher. So... Um, and then uh, third quarter, uh, let's we'll get to, get to that in a second. So, anyways, I was, the model was really good in the first quarter, not so good in the second quarter, and it's been on track in the third quarter so far. And here's what I'm seeing. Um, so, about uh, let me see, about a month or so ago, a month or two ago. Um, so, anyways, my my discipline consists of applying the model forecast to um, sectors, groups, and stocks. In 
Hey, Michael, you're. I think you might be moving around. Your reception is. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, Mike, Michael, so down, so down. Michael, are you stationary? Because the reception is kind of going in and out. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. But for the last, just wind, rewind twenty seconds because we lost you a little bit. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'll put the phone down and try to point towards me. Okay. Um, so, uh, anyways, about a month, six weeks, two months ago. Um, my process, you know, I'm working 12 hour days, Friday through Monday, applying the model to everything, looking really closely at sector rotation. Okay. That's really kind of what I focus on and everything started broadening out big time. Um, and so it really changed my, I've been bearish in the second quarter. And then all of a sudden the indexes don't look that great. They look, I mean, I covered my shorts a month or so ago. Um, they look like they could kind of stagger higher, but you got to remember, um, FANG stocks are about uh, 28, 29% of the S&P. Those are the top 10, you know, New York FANG, 10 top biggest cap stocks, and they're 50% of the NASDAQ. Now, those things, getting back to the, um, the uh, what part of the game are we in, what inning, um, in the model forecast, those are like, 14th inning, you know, if there's any foreign listeners on here, they ask me about baseball because they're not, they don't know the, the, the U.S. game, nine innings, right? Um, the, you know, all these fang stocks that everyone's still like, you know, the AI craze, those are like so, so far overshot, you know, I mean, way, 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 way overshot. Okay, that's one, that's one little thing from the forecast. But on the other hand, they, it really started broadening out about, you know, like I said, six weeks ago. So energy, financials, industrials, materials, and real estate. So my methodology is I run the sector relative to the index. So all of a sudden, these sectors that nobody's really paying attention to started really having an outperform forecast and an absolute up. So I run everything relative, absolute. So relative to the index, and then in absolute terms, what are they supposed to do? So all these all these other sectors, not tech, not communication services. That's where all the New York Fang kind of stocks are in. Um, so current view is everybody got squeezed. Like, okay, so I, I have the model forecast and I have the investment strategist hat. Well, how does this all make sense, right? So I have the black box thing, which is pretty reliable. It's obviously not 100%, but it's proved it's, it's worth over time. Um, but then, like, just I kind of overlay uh, what's going on in the real world. How does that fit into what's happening? So I think what happened is, you know, this AI craze got everyone squeezed. Portfolio managers, mo FOMO, fear of missing out, got squeezed into these top 10, you know, Meta, Google, uh, Alphabet, et cetera, Microsoft, um, all these kind of stocks. And now they're really overweight them and they're kind of missing out for the most part on what's happening where these other sectors and groups are outperforming the market. So let me give you the overall view. I think the market could kind of stagger higher um, with this group and sector rotation for another couple months. So where are we now? July 28th. So August, September. So I'm, uh, I don't think it's going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination. I think actually it's really overstretched short term. There'll be pullbacks, but I think um, the market wants to go higher for another couple of months. So you can think of the model forecast as saying, what, does the, what, it, what is it saying? It's, it's telling you what the market, market is looking for an excuse to do before it does it. And um, so the market's looking for an excuse to stagger higher, but the indexes are weighed down by these FANG stocks, New York FANG top 10 cap stocks, which I overowned, and I have them as underperform. Um, you know, I think that that's going to be the pain trade. So hedge funds and individual investors, retail investors, big portfolio managers were underperforming. They got squeezed into these things. Now they're overweight. And... Um, I think the AI story is overblown. Yeah, it's something. I'm not a Luddite. It, I, I try using this stuff. I'll give you an idea. I use BARD. I ask, I ask BARD for things, and it gives me answers that are hallucinations. I ask them for specific. BARD is the Google 
APT chat thing, chat APT thing. It gives me specific um, answers with it, with specific text of saying this is the answer to your question with a URL. And then when I click on the URL and look at it, it doesn't exist. And I go back and say, why are you ta why are you giving me things that don't work? I it says, we're, this is what, when I search for them in Google, it says, we're sorry, the page you were looking for cannot be found. And then, so I tell Bard this and it says, you are correct, the URL provided does not work. <laughs> That's it. And then it says, at the end, I go back and forth four or five times and it says, and then Bard comes back and says, I apologize for the error. I am still under development and learning to provide accurate information. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and understanding. I mean, this is the thing that's supposed to revolutionize the world. It just makes shit up, you know? I mean, complete hallucinations. It's not even close. Nothing resembles what it says. And it's really specific about the answer. I mean, it's not general. It gives you, like, this whole thing that doesn't exist. So, to me, it's a crack up. I mean, obviously, there's something there. I mean, you're supposed to, at some point, maybe they'll figure out how to revise this to fact check it so it doesn't give you bullshit answers. But right now, for my purposes, I can't really trust it, right? Okay, so I think that that's what people are going to discover. You know, that's an anecdote. Um, <clears throat> I think that people are going to discover that AI is not all it's cracked up to be. It's not this big money maker. Yeah, it's not going to go away. And maybe in another two or five or ten years or something, it will be great and or something. Just like the internet back in the height of the tech bubble, all those companies that were um, you know hyped up on speculation, they a lot of those ended up going down 80, 90 percent. So, anyways, that's further out. So the point is, New York Fang, forget about it. Don't buy that shit up here. You know, I mean, as an underperform, um, I think it's going to be the underperforming thing in the market for the next few months. And that will weigh the indexes down because of the weight in the indexes, you know, almost 30% for the S&P, 50% for the NASDAQ. So that's the downside. So what's going to go up? So um, I ran a chart in this week's Belkin report. Um, uh, showing sector flows for the last year. And tech is like up off the chart. It's all tech. Tech, all the money's gone into tech. Up uh, 24, this is global, uh, last 12 months weekly dollar billion. I got this from, from B of A, investment strategy. Uh, so tech, if you look at this chart, it's tech is just, Nothing else has gone up like that. And at the bottom, it's energy. Energy has gone off the bottom of the chart. So what have people been doing? They've been buying the shit out of tech and selling the heck out of energy. Everything else is kind of in the middle. So um, I think there's a great long short here. The model happens to have tech as the biggest underperform. So I go 12-week forecast and also monthly turning down. Um, tech to be underperforming. So I have the thing that people have bought the most of as the biggest underperformer. And what do I have as the biggest outperformer energy? The sector that nobody likes, that, you know, all this ESG stuff, um, you know, portfolios, you know, portfolio managers have been dumping these stocks because they're not, they're not green, you know. So there's this huge institutional bias against energy. And I think, anyways, great long short position here. Like, so if you're... If you're a hedge fund, you know what I'm talking about. You can be market neutral, long, XLE, that's the energy sector. Even better, XOP, that's oil and gas. XLE is weighed down by um, Exxon and Chevron, the biggest cap stocks, which both came out with crappy earnings last few days. Um, <clears throat> uh, XOP, uh, the model has an outperform signal for the more medium size, not the huge ones. So I'm not saying buy Chevron and Exxon. It's more... Um, I get into the individual stocks in the report. I don't know if we'll have time for that here, but anyways, energy up. And where are we in that game, in that baseball game? First, second inning, okay? Brand new signal. It's going to continue for a while. Now, let's put the investment strategist hat on for a second and say, what's been going on in the physical energy market? Okay, so the... Uh, let's go that bullet point. Um, now, uh, um, so the 
Biden administration has been draining the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, SPR, and they've cut it by almost half. And they, they were very upfront about this. They said, we're doing this to, because the price of gas is too high. You know, I'm paraphrasing. But um, that's not what the Strategic Petroleum Reserve was created for. If you go back to 1983, when it was recreated, it was to uh, counteract severe energy disruptions. Okay, so what they've been doing is maybe illegal. It's at least unethical and it's totally political. But the um, it's over, okay? So about two or three weeks ago, they stopped. They ran out of, um, you know, it, basically they've cut it in half almost in the last year or so, um, particularly intense in the last six months. Um, and uh, so they're in a, like a tug of war with OPEC, you know, obviously politicians want to get reelected and they want it. Uh, and, you know, they know high gas prices are bad for their reelection. So this is not a partisan thing. You know, I hate all politicians, you know, but I'm just telling you, this is the background to what's going on. Um, so that's over strategic petroleum reserve model forecast up. And actually they've started, uh, they've issued contracts for August and September. So they're, they're, they're kind of piddly. They're not, it's nothing big yet, but the point is there's no more artificial suppression of the physical crude oil price. And the model forecast is up. So that's my strongest signal, okay? Crude oil price up, energy products up, gas price up, heating oil, all this stuff, even natural gas, which is, you know, is acting like a dog. But all that stuff's supposed to go up three month view at least. So going into the end of the year, energy number one long. And um, so when I go XLE divided by crude oil, so XLE divided by USO, you know, that's the uh, energy ETF. It's barely even started to outperform. So that's what's coming ahead. You know, in an in energy rally, the energy stocks start outperforming oil. That hasn't, even ha hasn't started to happen yet. So that's what I mean. First, second inning, good place to be energy. It's, um, it's it, you know, okay. Number two, China. Okay, China has really been in the doghouse for a long time, right? Um, so I my model turned on China about a month or two, month, six weeks ago. It was rough at first. Uh, it, pulled, it started breaking out, pulled back. Then all of a sudden, they're finally coming out with a stimulus package. And I hate to sound like a bubble person. You know, the bubble person, bubble people are always, you know, salivating um, over stimulus. Stimulus, stimulus, stimulus. Okay. Well, but China... The market, if you look at it, it's been destroyed. It's way down in the gutter. Um, their their property market is a disaster. You know, all these property, these building companies are going bankrupt. And if there was ever a time that called for stimulus, it's now in China. And they they haven't come out with a a bazooka, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. But the what they are doing, they've come out with something marginal, and they just had the Polit Politburo meeting and they are aware of this and they're starting to do tailored things and that's probably enough to get the market going and if you look at it today so what's fxi doing it's up on the week eight percent it's up four or five percent um on the day and kweb kweb which is the china internet stock index is up 11 percent a week so that's basically just starting to work so that's been my, one of my top recommendations in the Belka report, long China, long energy. So China's starting work, first big week. I mean, you know, I'm not saying, I, I hate, you know, when something's up 10%, you know, it's always, you know, you can get hurt by uh, chasing something that's up a lot. So wait for pullbacks. But um, what inning are we in first, second inning China? So China's going to rally probably, you know, barring a, Taiwan, China war, which I have no particular insight into the timing of. It probably will come at some point. But um, uh, so China energy outperform. And um, so China drives a lot of stuff in the world, Chinese demand, right? So materials really depressed. So if I go, if I go to commodities, like I said, um, energy weight, energy up big time. A bunch of other commodities. So let me let's just look at the yeah commodities, commodities, commodities. Where are you? Uh, okay. So I've got base metals. 
huge buy, really depressed. Uh, copper, lead, nickel, tin, all the stuff that China consumes when they're doing stimulus programs, right? Um, this probably won't be the same as usual. They're not, you know, it's not like after 2009 when they started a big building boom, an infrastructure boom, but it'll be in that direction at least. And these are really depressed right now. Nickel, tin, zinc, look at all those things. Um, so there's an e there's an ETF for that. It's not very liquid. DBB, dog, boy, boy. Uh, it's the base metals uh, fund. Grains, grains are like, whoa. They they've been bouncing around like a yo-yo, but... Um, Shortage of wheat, you know, because of what's going on in Ukraine with uh, Russia restricting shipments. But um, even, you know, before that even happened, the model had this. So soybeans, wheat, oats, soy meal, bean oil up, corn up, rice up. Uh, China, I mean, India, biggest uh, rice exporter in the world, just cut off uh, supplies of non-basmati rice. And so um, there's a shortage uh, you know, there's a, you know, there's droughts and stuff going on in the world. So grains, energy, base metals up. Um, okay, so uh, how, that plays into some sector plays too. So in Europe, um, I have a lot of buy signals on basic resources stocks. Um, that's a sector that's out of favor. Nobody really likes it too much. Um, it's, it took off this week. It's been sloppy. You know, hasn't. It's been a rough trade so far. But those are the kind of things that that the stocks that rally on Chinese stimulus. So basic resources stocks in Europe, also here. So XLB. That's B for boy. That's the uh, materials sector in the U.S. outperform. So these are the kind of things I see outperforming for the next couple, three months. And lo and behold, financials. Okay, even I have financials as a huge buy starting about a month ago. And um, these were shorts. By the way, the Belkin report's not a, not a, a stopped clock. It, it changes. So financials, you know, I was short the banks, regional banks, uh, when they were going down, community banks. Those are buys now, but not so much, not so much the... Uh, the really crappy ones, um, those are risky. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, it could be take unders, um, like there was with Pacific West uh, this week. But um, just in general, the financial sector looks like it wants to go up. So I even have uh, money centered banks, JPM, Bank of America, first on the list, um, things like that. And the, the, the more larger regional banks, KEY, things like that. Um, <clears throat> um, so energy outperforms and goes up in absolute terms. Uh, uh, financials outperform and go up in absolute terms. Industrials, now that's been a little bit sloppy. Um, I, the model still likes industrials, didn't mention that yet, but um, we're starting to see the first signs, like the airlines got trashed this week. Now airlines were a big outperform signal about six weeks ago. All of a sudden they're kind of breaking down. But um, there's a lot of other like machinery stocks, GE had great earnings, things like that. Uh, industrial conglomerates, et cetera. Uh, um, and materials, and then even REITs, real estate. Uh, it's, a, it's the only defensive sector I have an outperform signal. It's at the bottom of the outperform list. But um, let me just kind of put this together in a scenario. So um, I, I think the pain trade for hedge funds is they got, they, they underperformed the market. They weren't making any money. I mean, this is in general. I'm not saying picking on anybody in particular, but just in general. They got squeezed for FOMO, you know, fear of missing out into New York Fang stocks. Now, those are going to become dogs. You know, I just, the model does not like them. Like I said, it's 14th inning. Like, how far can you cram these things up on false ideas about AI? You know, I mean, yeah, it's going to work out eventually, but now, it's, this is way, 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 way overdone, like beyond, beyond. Okay, so now you get the, all these, not just hedge funds, but long only portfolio miners, mo momentum guys, right? They're long this stuff, and it really hasn't been outperforming. It is, you know, last few days, but um, if you look at New York FANG index relative to the S&P, since June, middle of June, it went a little bit higher in relative terms than underperformed. So basically, there's been no alpha in that stuff, you know, kind of, a, yeah, and fits, fits and bursts, but then it kind of gives it back. So um, that's not where the action is. No, not tech, not fang. And a lot of uh, tech stocks, 
like so my model cell list beneath the surface so my set so that was on a sector level on a group level it looks like this so i've got fang these are my these are the things i say telling clients belkin report clients cell in short fang semiconductors not working today because of intel obviously software software's been a dog if you look at igv that's the um software etf it's been flat for three weeks with the market going up microsoft kind of acting starting to act very toppy um computers cybersecurity, internet stocks uh if you go down the the capitalization spectrum a lot of these stocks are not acting so great you know i had snap had horrible earnings, the stock cratered. Um, and then, uh, so that's, those are my sell ideas, the model sell ideas. So, and the, the groups, I said, you know, oil and gas, energy service, banks, two big uh, uh, money center banks, even securities brokers, they're not down so much. Uh, metals and mining stocks, not gold yet. Gold could be bottoming. So um, I have gold in the gold, in the Belkin gold stock report. I have a few buys just starting to come into range, but um, it's not, it's going to take another few weeks probably there. Agriculture stocks, huge buy. Um, that's really been working and they're really depressed. Uh, I won't go into names here, but um, also after that, things like auto components, specialty retailers, machinery, uh, paper and forest products, really depressed stocks. They're really in the gutter. So this is really a buy low, sell high strategy. That's what the model does, by the way. So it's it's really it's looking to cycle into things when they're out of favor. And that could be in relative terms, like they look like they're up in absolute terms, but they've been uh, underperforming. So they're going into rotation as outperformers. Oh, by the way, one idea on the energy. A-L-M-P, that's Otto, Larry, Mary, Paul. That's the um, energy uh, MLP, multi-limited partnership. It's basically pipelines. 8% dividend yield. This thing is asking, you know, it's just, it's a perfect buy for this scenario that I'm, that I'm laying out here. 8% dividend yield and upside with an energy stock rally. So if you're conservative and you're looking for income and you also want to participate and you think the energy stocks could rally, AMLP, it's not the most liquid thing in the world. It's a few billion market cap. So it's not for like gajillionaire, gajillion, you know, multi-trillion dollar fund managers. But for probably most of the people uh, listening to this spaces, it's, you could, it's probably something you could do without getting squeezed too badly. Um, and what else? Uh, solar. No, solar's been acting like a dog. Solar, I have it as an outperform, hasn't been working, but I think it's gonna be squeezed into the energy outperform. Um, you know, I think First Solar had good earnings. I haven't looked at it today. And by the way, also EVs. So I'm long some of these stocks that short sellers probably have big positions in. I'm not trying to squeeze the shorts, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying I'm actually been warning short sellers, look out. You know, be, have some risk control here because they could they could jam up some of these um, more crappy stocks. So, uh, by the way, I have one of my clients um, is a alpha capture hedge fund. You know, big play. There's a couple, a few of these around, and they um, I'm they have 182 contributors of which I am one. And what they do is they they take your uh, you're getting 50. Uh, you know, positions, um, there's all kinds of, you know, there's gold, everything but from Goldman to indep independent re uh, researchers like me to buy side guys, everything, are, uh, you know. And um, so right now I'm ranked number two uh, out of 182. And I'm not boasting. Don't get me wrong. I've learned boasting, you know, pride comes before a fall. You know, that's how to get in trouble. You know, I've, I've learned to, to fade my emotions. Uh, but the point is, um, I'm just, I've been putting things on exactly like in the Belkin report, exactly like what I've been telling you. And it's working really well in Q3. So I'm up 15% in that alpha capture system, which is totally market neutral. Okay, it's not, you don't, not, it's not, abs so it's absolute gain, yeah, but it's totally market neutral. So, um, and uh, by the way, I was also really good in the first quarter, not good in the second quarter. So up overall about 32% market neutral 
year to date in that uh, Alpha Capture platform. Again, not boasting. You know, God have mercy on me. I, if, you know, that's what happens when when you stand up on a pedestal out from left field comes a bulldozer, knocks you over. So I'm please don't do that to me. Um, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I have energy stocks outperforming. I have agriculture stocks outperforming, and I have Chinese stocks outperforming. And EV, even this XPEV, XPeng, if you guys know this one, that's been um, the best performing stock. I've had that on for six weeks or so, and VW came in and, and put a, a, they invested $700 million, I think, in them. They're partnering with XPE, XPEV, whatever, XPeng is the name. Uh, for Chinese um, uh, EV uh, exposure. Okay, so that's pretty much the overview. Let me just kind of summarize, say a few other things here. Okay, Japan came out with the um, yield curve control modification today. It's kind of a snooze, but um, it knocked, bonds were down this week on speculation of that. I'm kind of neutral on bonds. I've been short bonds for a while. I'm only short JGBs at the moment. Um, so I think the, the move in bonds is kind of overextended to the downside. I, I also want to talk about inflation here. Um, but um, let, me just, let me just go through the rest of these things I have on the list. Uh, Bitcoin. People, I know that's important to some, some of you guys. Uh, I have a, a weak downward forecast for Bitcoin. And they really jammed the Bitcoin stocks up, Mira, all these things. Um, I think it's kind of ridiculous. I, I don't like Bitcoin. It's not a strong signal, but it's not like something you want to be long at this point. I said software. It's been a, a dog. You know, no, no progress in IGV. Um, D -B 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 -B. Okay, even ARK. Okay, A-R-K-K, -K, you know, George's nemesis. Um, that, I have a, it's more like eighth inning for that. But um, she's got some of the stocks on that could actually work in this environment. You know, um, EV stocks, uh, sort of new energy, solar energy. I, I haven't even looked at her portfolio. But anyways, I wouldn't be short ARK at this point. So I'd be long things like XOP, um, FXI, Frank, X independent FXI, that's the China ETF, KWEB, KWEB. Again, those are up big here. Wait for pullbacks. Don't go rushing in when they're up 8%, 11% on the week. Um, if you want a market neutral thing, I just think long energy, short tech. Okay, so that's long XLE, short XLK. Uh, no big, that's, that's bottom of the first inning, okay? First batter's at the plate. The game hasn't even started in that, okay? It's up a little bit on the week, half percent, no big deal. But I, I don't think there's much downside in that. And I think if you want to just be, if you're, if you're nervous about the market and you just want to say, like, you know, if you know how to do spreads, you put an equal dollar amount on on each side. You might want to delta hedge it, you know, or change as, as over time, change the dollar amounts to keep it market neutral, but uh, that's my number one long. And also, um, by the way, uh, uh, value versus growth. So that's IWD for dog, IWF for Frank. So D, the first one's value, second one's growth. That's another uh, market neutral. I think values, that kind of fits into the sector rotation idea. The stuff that people don't really pay attention to wants to outperform. Financials, that's the biggest weight in the value fund. Tech is the biggest weight in the um, growth fund. So it's another kind of way to do the same thing. I, I like XLE, XLK better than that. But those are two market neutral ideas if you know how to do spreads. Um, okay, now let's talk about inflation for a second. Um, about a year ago, I think it was last October, November, I put out a chart when inflation, when the CPI was 7.5% or something, saying a forecast that it would be down to 3% by uh, May this year. And lo and behold, that's pretty much what happened. Not precisely, that's not 100%. Um, but that was, the, that was the model forecast. Um, and it was also a function of the base effect. It was just obvious that what was going to happen was that, that you're comparing to a higher level. So the way the mathematics of rates of change work, it was going to be easy to look lower. Okay. That is over. Okay, I thank you. I'm closing out my short inflation position. Um, 
Now, this everything that I'm telling you about energy and base metals in China, Chinese demand and grains and all this stuff. So I, the model was short all this stuff back then. It was short energy, short grains, short base metals, and, and it, all this stuff went down big time. It's now the opposite. So the inflation, the forward-looking kind of PPI sort of stuff, producer price index things, are looking up. There, there's not going to be any good news there. In the you know, next three months, going into the end of the year, there's going to be inflation is going to look worse um, on the leading stuff. Now, I'm not sure what that's going to do to the economy. Okay, uh, now, where are we in the economy? So um, I'm actually seeing some of the PMI, manufacturing PMI looks like it's bottoming, okay? And I've been short those. The model has had a downward forecast for ISM indexes, things like that. They now look like they're bottoming, manufacturing side. Same thing with services. Didn't really go below 50. Manufacturing went way below 50. So it looks like there could be some kind of a rebound in manufacturing, uh, and inflation could look worse. Now, the question is, I think, um, I, again, now I've got my investment strategist hat on saying what, what, what are the implications of what the model forecast is saying. Okay, so... The implications are, I think, if energy, you know, so where are we now? Crude oil is blah, blah, blah. Uh, crude oil is about almost 80 bucks. Um, crude oil, where could it go? Uh, up another 10, 20 bucks. You know, not overnight, but kind of le le sort of lurch, lurch higher. Um, and, you know, the energy stocks outperform, the sectors, you know, change. Um, I think that's going to be bad for the economy, obviously. Duh. <laughs> Hello. Uh, higher energy prices are going to make things look worse. It's going to be, um, it's going to increase costs for corporations and, you know, individual investors, et cetera. So um, uh, the economy, that is the thing that's going to throw probably a bucket of cold water on the economy. So even though I'm seeing... Uh, a put the potential for an increase in things like ISM, manufacturing PMIs, even services PMIs. Um, and also, just a little aside, digression on that, the model forecast on the Fed, the things that the Fed uses for inflation, the PCE services, et cetera, all those kind of things, those are stuck at a high level. You know, I mean, those are not going down. So we got inflation is kind of stuck here. So I don't think we're, you know, this concept of everywhere you see now, soft landing, soft landing, the feds want miracle workers. Blah, 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 blah. No, sorry. Um, we, they, we're still reaping the, the, the uh, blowback from what they did before when they screwed up. Um, and uh, okay, one other digression that's really important here. Um, uh, government spending. Okay, so remember the debt, def the debt limit. Uh, you know, con the the conflict over that I mean, a month or two ago. Okay, when that was settled, they unleashed the dragons of. <laughs> look, so um, I, you have to smooth government spending to get an idea, kind of, it's jittery, jittery from month to month. But when you smooth it, it shows growing at like mid double digit percentage annual rate. Okay, so there's this hidden fiscal expansion going on. And what do you expect these guys to do? Pol politicians, right? They want to get reelected. Janet Yellen, you know, etc. So she's, they've unleashed the gates of of government spending. And I, I don't think that's getting enough attention at all. I'm like only the only ones I've seen talking about this. It's a hidden fiscal expansion in the U.S., big time. Like not, I mean, it's, last time I looked, it was 15, 18, 18% um, annual rate on the smooth series. That's huge, right? You know, like what, you know, that's enormous expansion in spending. So that's not, that's going to keep growth looking okay, right? It's like we're not going into the Great Depression at this point. But when it's going to, you know, collide with this higher, you know, so what, what they're doing is pump priming the system and energy price going up is going to collide with that at some point towards the end of the year. So my general over, overall view is even though the market looks like a huge bubble, AI bubble, and it is on the AI tech New York fang side, th that's not the place to be. However, there is a long opportunity in stocks like, let me just throw a few out here. Hey, Michael, uh, um, you, yeah. you've given a wealth of information. 
uh, well past 45 minutes. So I was just wondering, say, say you got to save some for paying subscribers. So um, I was wondering if we could go to some Q&A perhaps, if that's okay with you? Absolutely. Sure. Perfect. Okay. So anyone who wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. I've got a couple questions from the audience. Um, what is it you feel most uncertain about, Michael? Uh, most, uh, say that again. I'm sorry. What well, do you can, feel? What, yeah. What do you feel most uncertain about? Most uncertain about. Okay. Uh, let me think about that. Um, let me just or give if that nothing some... really is glare, if nothing's really glaring, um, let me ask a slightly related question. What would have to happen for you to change your views? You're basically following uh, prices, or what, 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 would, what would result in you? What would have to happen for you to change your views? Again, I, this inning idea, you know, the model, I, I just stick with the model. You know, I don't overlay my feelings or something on it. So um, it's really good. As you know, and everybody who's listening to this knows, the market is a battlefield every day. You get up in the morning, it's like being in the trenches in Ukraine. You stick your head up, somebody's shooting at you, you know, the other side. And um, so the model is a good way, you know, I, I, it's just like having a GPS saying, what do I do? do I, you know, which direction do I go? And so it helps to, to withstand <clears throat> some, of, some of these moves that seem like an, an intraday basis, it can look horrendously wrong, you know, and then all of a sudden, by the end of the week, it's working. So um, all I can say is, in inning terms, the tech thing, which I have been wrong on, okay, so I, I, my certainty level is, is, is super high on that. So I go, you know, New York Bank by S&P, direction, intensity, down, huge, huge underperform. And it hasn't been working, but the signal is still there, really strong, okay? And flip side of the coin energy divided by s&p up relative so you know i just kind of stick with the model forecast that's all i can do makes sense makes sense okay let's move on to uh some of our friends in the audience ken good to see you the floor is yours <clears throat> please speak up hey george uh thanks it's so good to uh see you out on twitter again um and i uh, love uh what michael does uh, so michael uh, the reits call uh, what particular areas of, of REITs would you focus on? You know, WP Carry is a name that, you know, they have a lot of long-term lease kind of things and they're not usually as under as much pressure. Or would you focus on um, uh, multifamily? Do you have it any more specific than just REITs? Yeah, I can throw a few names out. Um, so again, the model doesn't know what you're talking about. It doesn't know, it's not looking at the fundamentals of what the REIT does. It just goes, it's time series analysis. So it's the REIT divided by the S&P wants to go up. And then I run the REIT, individual REIT stocks relative to the REIT group, right? And when I come up with that, so I'll just give you the top four or five names. They're just headline, you know, VNO, BXP, PEAK, Starwood, STWD, even uh, re retail REITs, SPG, um, and e uh, WY, which is a paper and forest products company, but they turned it into a REIT. And even like, like I said, retail REITs, where are those? Um, one second. Uh, retail REITs, uh, kind of really crappy ones. Even Ceratage, you know, what the, uh, so CEQP, ENI, E N L C. I'm sorry, C Q P. Uh, and I'm sorry. These are energy LMPs. REITs. S L G M A C S R G R P T. So, um, not necessarily the highest quality ones. Again, this is a buy low. Yeah. The, uh, getting back to the idea, the model likes to buy low and sell high. So a lot of, sometimes, and even frequently, the stocks that uh, it says to buy look like they're in the gutter and you would say scratch your head and say why would anybody want to buy that but um those are the those are the few names i can come up with right now for you i uh, appreciate it thanks kim okay let's go now to rob isbitz and then michael hell rob uh, good to see you please unmute yourself hey thank you george wow Whew. big deep breath so great to be back in uh in this group and by the way just quickly um 
I'm not doing a lot of work for ETF.com, and I'm putting a brainstorming group of financial advisors together, like my friend Ken, who just spoke. Uh, so anybody who's interested in being part of that, just let me know. Okay, Michael, uh, uh, George didn't use one of his classic uh, expressions. It was a tour de force. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think I'm realizing I've been a chartist for 40-something uh, years. Uh, your system and my system tend to end up in a lot of the same places because XOP and PDBC, a commodities ETF, are the last two things I bought in my model. So uh, we're in sync. Here is my question for you. Um, and this is something I've been writing about all year. It is something that I've been following for a long time. And I just don't know if a lot of people in the industry are really tracking this. And it goes something like this. The Dow and the NASDAQ have basically made the S&P 500 less relevant. And what I mean by that is, okay, there's two camps. There's the FANG, Sexy 7, Magnificent 7, whatever you want to call it, okay, represented broadly by the Qs. And then you've got the Dow 30, which basically are like, you know, I mean, th those of us have been around for a while, uh, you know, remember it was the blue chips and the secondaries, right? Um, the Dow versus the NASDAQ, and there have been some ridiculously large spreads on let's call it three, six month basis between the NASDAQ. I mean, NASDAQ outperforming the Dow by you know 40 percent in six months. And then it goes the other way, of course, last year. So here's my question, Michael Belkin. Uh, do you see what I see? And do you think that, let's say, to simplify a lot of the things that you've been talking about, it basically is a risk on, risk off, relatively speaking, because they're all stocks, so they're all volatile. Um, is there something there? Is this a relationship that, let's say, sort of um, symbolizes a lot of the things that you were saying specifically about, you know, uh, uh, tech versus energy? And can you look at it very simply or more broadly through a QQQ versus DIA? Thank you. Okay, hang on. So I go, I, I, I just put that into the model real quick. NDX, this is what I do. So the model's a hypothesis tester. You know, so somebody asks me a question like that, and I go, all right, <laughs> I just run it, you know, so what does the model say? Um, so first of all, the NASDAQ has been flat versus the S&P and the Dow for almost two months. So going back to the beginning, hey, Michael, Michael, yes. Michael, hold on for a second. Michael, Michael, I think you're breaking up. Yeah, he is. Uh, and what I'm saying is, it's a hey, what I'm saying is, it's a cyclical relationship. Do you see it as a meaningful cyclical relationship, as really kind of a a, a broader market marker uh, to help determine when, you know, the risk on versus the uh, more defensive stuff. Because uh, like what I'm finding in my own work is that uh, the Qs and the DIA, if I just watch those two, you know, everything else I can kind of get to later tonight or on the weekend, you know, that that just seems to be the sort of signature uh, 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 relationship that is driving the market right now. True or false? Um, OK, uh, so somewhere in the middle, I just so I just ran it while you're talking. Can you hear me now? Is it better? Can you? Yeah, am I coming you. Yep. OK. You. All right. Um, all right. So I, I have I go NDX divided by DGAIA weekly. Direction down, intensity strong, position first, second inning. Okay, and absolute also is down for the NASDAQ. So if you're saying that the NASDAQ going down wants to make is a signal for the market, I don't think so this time. Okay, so again, this gets back to what I'm saying, the great rotation, which is the title of this no, George Noble Spaces. Um, I think the market is going, the indexes are going to be weighed down and be sloppy because of underperformance by those big cap tech stocks. But 
that is not where the action is. The action is in is in um, energy, <laughs> financials, industrials, materials, and real estate. And uh, so um, the, the problem is that tech is such a big weight in the indexes. So I, I, it's always dangerous. Remember the title of the book, it's different this time. <laughs> so I would say generally, yeah, what you're saying is true. Tech, when tech starts underperforming, it's risk off for the market. But this time there's something else going on because there's all this money pump priming going on, fiscal spending and the economy's and energy's going up. The economy's not going down yet. <clears throat> so I have a feeling, you know, not a feeling, let's, let this investment strategist view is the indexes are not the place to be, okay? So I, if you want to play this market, um, until volatility picks up, um, you know, I was having a great time last year uh, trading the intraday swings when the VIX was at a higher level. There were great, you know, four or 5% moves back and forth all the time. It's not like that anymore, right? You know, maybe today it is. But um, generally, in the, the index plays, I think, are going to be difficult. So I, I would say I would disagree with you um, in that for the next three-month view, um, tech could underperform massively where things like the Dow Jones could go up. And, and things energy led by stocks that nobody really cares about at this point. So a huge squeeze, which is a pain trade for people who are positioned, you know, that got squeezed into these tech stocks. Those tech stocks start underperforming. This other stuff's outperforming. And then the fear of missing out goes from tech to energy and financials in particular. So, yeah, I think that the indexes could, could kind of stagger higher for a little while. Um, but uh, with tech underperforming, which is not usually the way it works, that which you pointed out, I think. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's interesting to point out the change in change in leadership. Um, so terrific. Okay, let's go to uh, Michael Howe, uh, and then we'll go to uh, uh, Globro. Michael, good to see you. What's cooking, man? Yeah, hi, George. How, how you doing? Okay, good to be back on these things. Yeah, we're getting by. So. Two Michaels, uh, ex Solomon brothers, uh, have at it. Well, look, let, let me just give you um, uh, a quick um, sort of thumbnail of what, what I'm thinking. I mean, it's pretty, it sounds pretty similar to what Michael Belkin has just been alluding to from what I can gather. Uh, I mean, I've been pretty much upbeat on markets uh, through this year. Uh, there are two things that I look at which uh, have been going right. One is liquidity has been going up. Uh, despite the uh, sort of uh, brickbats that have been thrown and people saying that it's always going to about to come down, it's been edging up through through the year. The second thing is is that inflation has been coming down and the market is very sensitive to inflation. And providing that inflation falls at a faster rate than the economy slows, uh, the market's going to keep going up. And I think the uh, you know the backdrop on the economy looks pretty decent. Uh, at the end of the day, what you've got is an economy that is a lot less interest rate sensitive. Uh, than it's probably ever been. Uh, the service sector is still seems to be moving ahead. Uh, we're still below the trend line in terms of uh, pre-COVID uh, service spending. Um, so there's some catch up to go. And I think if you look at the cyclical elements of the economy, what really matters ultimately is what China's doing or what China does. And I think the news on China is nothing like as bad as people sort of maintain. I think the Chinese economy can get a bit of a lift in the second half. And Therefore, the uh, the view that Michael's got here, that Chinese stocks look good and materials and uh, cyclicals can outperform, I think makes sense. You know, as far as I can see, I think the uh, we've got a we've got a, a tailwind behind investors now. I think liquidity is going to keep expanding until probably 2025, 2026, that sort of period. Uh, markets, of course, never go up in straight lines, but I think the backdrop is pretty good. And that that's it. That's a that's my view. So, and uh, along with that, Michael, just curious, what's your take on, do uh, you have any strong views on bonds? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been downbeat on bonds. I think the, the backdrop on bonds is not great. Uh, what the JG, what the Japanese did today with the JGB market and, uh, you know, this sort of adaption of yield curve control, it's not the end of liquidity inflows in Japan by any means. Uh, there is an attenuation on what they're doing that's been long anticipated. Uh, the backdrop at the end of the day will mean that probably yields could at most rise in Japan 50 bips, but it's, it's not going to be anything like that. But it, 
you know that's the potential and i think that has the 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 risk is that that will translate through into the u.s market uh the treasury market still looks vulnerable i think at the longer end uh it's not vulnerable from a policy rate standpoint because i think we're pretty much near the peak in rates but it's very vulnerable from a term premium standpoint and the fact that you know i've made the point on your uh, on your spaces before that the anomaly in the markets is the term premium in the U.S., but also worldwide, kind of at rock bottom levels. You're looking at the U.S. 10-year uh, term premium minus 180 basis points. I mean, it's all-time lows. And that's because of a shortage of issuance, largely. Issuance is going to start coming back. Janet has you know, tweaked it near term by putting the emphasis on bills. But at some stage, coupon issuance has got to step up. Uh, it looks like deficit's going to be running uh, for the next few years at about $2, two trillion a year. Uh, so there's a lot of funding to do, particularly if they're going to start refilling uh, a bit more into the TGA. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the market at the long end. And if the JGB starts to edge up as well, you've got pressure. So I think you're going to get a bearish steepening, a slight bearish steepening of the yield curve, which st strikes me. You don't really want duration in this market. The front end, if you're going to be in bonds, be at the front end. And the other thing is that as far as I can see, the corporate market doesn't look too bad, actually. Um, you know, yields of the the uh, the amount corporations have been paying in interest has kind of flatlined for the last six or nine months. They, despite the rise at the front end, most corporates are borrowing down the curve. Uh, their their uh, cost of borrowing hasn't changed much, and I think you've got the curious anomaly, which economists haven't really addressed yet, that because you've got corporates borrowing down the curve and you've got a whole lot more at the front end. Uh, sitting on large cash piles, actually an inverted yield curve is sort of net cash positive of the corporate sector. So it's not an inflation uh, you know, measure. It's actually almost indicating the opposite, that an inverted curve is actually quite good for the corporate sector, which is a great paradox. But hey, this is the world we're in. Crazy times. Uh, just on the commodities call, um, just curious about crude oil. I mean, Michael thinks uh, crude can go higher. I'm just curious about your outlook for oil in particular, not just oil itself, but also is oil has a big influence on liquidity, both uh, you know, as the price goes up, absorbs liquidity and vice versa. Do you have a particular view on, uh, on crude oil, Michael? I've got a view. I think commodity markets are definitely picking up. I think they've, they've, got, uh, they've got the wind behind them a bit more now. They're catching more of a bit. I think oil is in that same, obviously in that same complex. Um, you know, China clearly makes a big difference to all that. I think the other thing you've got to start factoring in is uh, next month, uh, there is this uh, BRICS so or this uh, slated BRICS meeting in Johannesburg where they're going to probably adopt a gold-backed currency. Uh, you know, the question is, is that, um, uh, is that bearish for the dollar? Um, I, I don't know. I, my view is probably not in the medium term, uh, but it certainly isn't bullish. Uh, I think you can look at it that way. And it may well cause gold prices to go up and people to be you know, concerned generally about the commodity complex. So I think that if anything, what you've got is, uh, you know, pressure for commodity prices to go up, particularly if they make that, uh, if they make that move, it's going to put it into the limelight. It'll spotlight commodity markets. Interesting, because as you said at the outset, your views tend to uh, broadly align with Michael Belkin's views. Uh, Michael Belkin, do you have any questions, comments, reactions for Michael Howe? Hey, that was great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, liquidity can you expand a little bit on uh what you said about you see liquidity picking up where where's that coming from well it's coming from a whole host of areas really i mean one is that you know i mean on 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 the on the fed or the us situation i'll come quietly and say that probably is at best flatlining i mean we argued i think on a on a spaces way back at the end of uh, 22 that after the british guilt debacle it looked like uh, the fed was flatlining liquidity uh, and then after SVB, they basically started to actually increase it. So they they stopped it, they stopped withdrawal of liquidity from the markets. Then they're putting it back in. That's all for financial stability reasons. And I can't really see why uh, they want to change that equation. So I think that the backdrop is pretty supportive in the U.S. Everything that the Fed and the Treasury are doing uh, has sort of got liquidity written over it or liquidity support. Uh, you know, the Fed, uh, sorry, the Treasury, I think, is doing a kind of quasi yield curve controlling what they're, you know, what they're doing with the bill market and whatever else. And, you know, talking about Treasury buybacks, I mean, it, it all smacks of this sort of thing, trying to influence duration kind of thing. Um, so I think from the US point of view, that's probably neutral. Uh, Japan is still increasing liquidity, despite what, uh, you know, people may infer from this yield curve control change. It doesn't alter the fact that the BOJ is adding liquidity. Uh, if you look at non 
um, Japan, Asia, emerging Asian central banks, they're accumulating dollars in their forex reserves. They're monetizing those. That's a lift to liquidity. You've got generally the dollar softening a bit, which is also a general sign of liquidity being supportive. And then if you look at the other factor, which is or the other two factors which are coming in, one of those is uh, is China. China has been hard pressed of late because of the weakness in the yuan. I think that's been an engineered change. Uh, in other words, there's been a lot of pressure on the yuan externally, uh, maybe artificially. And I think that may have been a negotiating point for Yellen's visit to the US. But I see that coming off. So I think that the Chinese will have an opportunity now to ease. And latest evidence in the last few days is there taking that up. So I think that Chinese liquidity will try and goose the economy in the next few months. So that's probably a positive. And then the other thing you've got is the private sector. And the key thing there is basically looking at the wholesale markets and the repo markets. And the very fact that uh, bond volatility has crashed from where it was uh, back in the in Q1, uh, m- the move index was recall about 200 or testing 200. It's now near a 100. So it's halved. And that drop means that the efficacy of collateral in the system goes up enormously. And that's another boost to liquidity. So, you know, if you look at add all these factors together, you know, I think it's broadly, you know, it's broadly supportive. It could be better and make no mistake about that. But I think that, you know, broadly speaking, liquidity conditions are not going down. They were going down heavily last year. Thanks for that. Much appreciated. Okay, let's move on now to uh, Globro and then uh, Average Joe. If anyone has a speaker, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Globro, good to see you. What's up? Thanks, George and Michael, for doing this. Um, quick disclaimer before I jump into it. I'm already long K-Web leaps from, so I'm long China, um, long gold, because that beautiful cup and handle, long oil. So, you know, the reflation trade, the unloved parts of the market trade. But Michael, question for you. I'm noticing that in the U.S. at least, the safety trades like utilities or healthcare will um, outperform to the downside and underperform to the upside. So given the weight of the FANG complex, right, the Magnificent Seven or what have you, how do you see that resolving? Like if they if they take a dump, they seem to drag everything down harder um, and people are ignoring the safety trade. But yeah, how do you see that resolving? I know we can't predict when, but just curious about your thoughts on that. Uh, good point. Uh... Okay, so uh, I, the only uh, defensive sector that I haven't underperformed on currently is consumer staples, and it's late. So um, it's, it's, uh, the, the model gives direction, position, intensity. Sometimes direction is neutral. Okay, so um, basically I'm neutral on utilities and healthcare at the moment. Um, it's kind of a zigzag, uh, so it, it's, it's sort of a kind of a BS answer for you, but um, it, that's what the model's saying is that's, there's not really a lot of information there. So um, I don't think it's, it doesn't seem to be setting up for a huge defensive outperform, defensive uh, for the next three months. Defensive outperform would be utilities, staples, and healthcare, sometimes REITs. Um, REITs are the, are the only defensive uh, sector up, and it's it's kind of more of a fi- related to financials thing. It seems like to me. So um, I, I, I'm watching that closely because that is one big confirmation when the market wants to go down. And, and don't get me wrong, everybody, I'm not a bubble person. Okay, this when this thing tops out and starts going down, uh, I intend to be there. Okay, and the model, and I'm seeing it out there, but it's out a couple three months, and at that time. Then, you know, if so, basically, I would say um, that we could turn into a huge divergence situation right here. So if the indexes kind of creep higher in a haphazard manner, but tech underperforms, uh, all these technicians will be saying, oh, it's a terrible divergence. It's a terrible divergence. The market can't keep, being, can't keep going up. Blah, blah, blah. But it actually, in my scenario, it could led by the orphans of the market, right? Energy, financials, things that would have been totally out of favor that nobody wanted to own, start outperforming. And that three, you know, that three quarters of the S&P 500, um, well, that's not, you know, those sectors aren't all three quarters, but three quarters is non-tech. The three quarters non-tech part of the S&P kind of drags the market in a, in a, uh, kind of zigzag manner higher while tech underperforms, that would really like send technicians for a loop 
saying, oh, God, you know, there's so many divergences in the market. It's so bad. You know? But if we could keep, I think that, that that's actually my scenario. Next couple, three months, te- ridiculous divergences build. Tech starts going down. And if you, um, <clears throat> that's kind of what happened sort of in 2000, after March 2000, where tech started going down and a lot of the def- uh, other stuff started going up. It was actually financials then. Um, and some utilities, but I'm not seeing it yet. So answer to your question is no for utilities, no for healthcare. Uh, staples, m- m- very mild signal, but not really, no high confidence on that at all. Mainly just um, tech, tech and tech only wants to underperform. And uh, all that other stuff I've been saying incessantly, you know, energy, financials, industrials, materials, and real estate outperform. So it's kind of a weird scenario. It's not typical by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, that's what I'm seeing. Hey, Michael, just a quick follow-up question. If you look at, I think I think the ETF for equal weight of tech, if I'm not mistaken, is QQQE as opposed to QQQ. So that removes you know the heavy uh, weighting of the uh, Magnificent 7. When you look at the signal for QQQE, that's equal weight of tech, what does that look like? Um, I don't have right it. Now? Yeah, yeah, here I am. Sorry. Uh, uh can you, I can, don't, can you put it into your model? What would you... I, I can't, not while we're on here. It'll take, it too, it'll take too much okay. time. But okay. um, I, I think what corresponds to that, I think my, the thing that springs to my mind to answer your question is the tech sector, XLK. So XLK has been like, so I go XLK, just hang on. That I can do. Just bear with me one second. XLK, it's now that has gone nowhere for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten weeks. XLK has all the big stuff in it, right? It's cap weighted, but it also has everything else, you know. And that, so you've had no alpha if you've been in tech relative to the S&P for the last 10 weeks. So there was a big shoot up on the NVIDIA earnings, right? And then nothing. So that, I think it's kind of, not a direct answer to your question, but I think that's a good picture. I, I, and I tell you, portfolio managers, I'm sure they know that. Because if they're not long those four or five stocks, even if they are, they see all these other stocks acting like crap, you know, like, um, you know, Snapchat, all these things. Um, so beneath, you know, tech is not acting that great outside of the top names. And it hasn't really, so the signal, so basically it's been flat for 10 weeks, right? 10 weeks, what's that? Two and a half months. Um, and it's absolute signal down. So it hasn't even started yet. First, second inning of underperformance, and it's just been sitting there for 10 weeks. So that's the best answer I can give you without having the data for what you asked for. Okay, and by the way, before we go to average, uh, Michael, um, could you just remind folks, uh, I'm going to give you a little plug here, for those that are interested in the Belkin Report, um, which is a tremendous value, uh, the Belkin Light Report, could you just tell them how they can get a hold of you or um, how they could subscribe? Oh, yeah, we should put up something. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not a very good salesman here. <laughs> Um, so we yeah, the Belkin reports for institutional investors. It has all the details on individual stocks everywhere in the world and, um, all the commodity markets and everything. Um, the, and then, so Hyperpyron partners, he's on there. You can see, maybe you can post something, uh, from, from him. He's, he markets all my stuff, Mark Mishkin, contact him for information. We have a, a, a slim down version, Belkin, uh, short report, Belkin report short, which uh, has all the commentary and the general ideas without all of the specifics. That's more, that was our idea to kind of help out individual investors, retail investors that can't afford the institutional product. But um, that's what I do. Well, I also have a gold stock report. And uh, uh, so uh, Hi- Mark Mishkin of Hyperpower and Partners handles all that stuff for me. And by the way, why? Th- thanks for that. While you were speaking, I just uh, pulled up uh, the, the uh, XLK, which is forty five percent. This is actually very interesting. You should look at this. I think it'll it'll, it'll it might actually buttress your your call for um, the, the Fang underperformance because it's, it's just Microsoft and Apple, right? Like those yeah, are the yeah, top. It, it, yeah, it, it's forty five. <laughs> XLK is forty five percent Microsoft and Apple. Okay, but if you look at QQQE. 
it's been underperforming for the longest time. However, in the last couple of months, it's actually outperforming. All right. And you look at QQQ, uh, sorry, that's, that's NASDAQ. Um, that, that, that's NASDAQ when it's, it's not all tech, but to give you a flavor for its uh, holdings, it's much different. I mean, Old Dominion Freight, Sirius, Charter, Align, Medical. So it's, it's really apples and oranges. But it just highlights even this thing, which has been a relative dog, is, 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 is doing better the last few months, starting to outperform um, the Qs, which I think was your main point. So thanks for that, Michael. Uh, before we go to Average Joe, if anyone has a question, uh, please raise their hand. Um, Average Joe, good to see you. The floor is yours. Uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you uh, for allowing me. Uh, Michael, I have, I've I've been watching and I've been investing in the mid-cap uh, ETFs uh, for the last six months. They've been moving pretty good, but they're heavily weighted, again, in technology, real estate, and um, as well as in energy. And, uh, you know, most of them are primary 98%, uh, you know, American uh, as well. Um I'm thinking about um, going down to the small caps. And um, do you think, you know, I should, I want to move away from the technology. I think that, you know, again, you know, you've said it over and over that we're primary at the top of it. So, um, you know, I, I want to get away from real estate. And, and um, so, you, you know, do you have any suggestions that, you know, uh, as far as small cap ETFs and as far as, um, you know, is it time for them to move with rates going up? Um, do you, you know, what would you recommend? Okay. While you were speaking, so I, I ran, again, the model's a hypothesis tester. So I ran um, S&P 400 mid, it's MID, relative to the Russell 2000, or and vice versa, R2, th small cap divided by mid cap, uh, uh, buy signal. So if you were market neutral, I'd rather be long um, IWM, Mary, for that's the Russell 2000 uh, small cap ETF than mid cap. Um, so, uh, and that probably gets in back to the idea of these cyclical stocks outperforming, you know, materials, industrials, things, more things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would switch if you're just strictly going by capitalization. It looks like the smaller is better for now, two, three month view. Um, but, you know, I would, having said that, I prefer more of a sector uh, approach, you know, saying energy, X, uh, so XOP and uh, KBE, I didn't mention that. That's the bank sector, ETF, regional bank. Those are still really depressed. So um, I, I prefer KBE, XOP, and China, which is not in anything probably too much. Um, and look out, not China today. It's up too much this week. Wait for a pullback. You know, but that would be so KWEB or FXI. So yeah, out, small cap outperform mid cap and outperform large cap. Yeah. Better ideas out there. Hey, Ma Thank you. Ma hey, thanks for having show. Hey, Michael, just curious. You, you, how does the Nikkei look to you? How does Japan look? Okay. Uh, top, toppy. <laughs> um, wow. However, okay. the, sector the, the sector rotation looks good. I don't have it as a short yet, but it could be coming into range soon. Um, you know, this it's obviously a momentous development to have – to have Japan inching away. They're the only place that's still doing this crazy, you know, QE all the time, negative interest rates forever, you know. And, and so to inch away from that, that's really a, a major, major, major development. But um, so I don't see it in the sector. So, uh, for instance, banks were up huge today, right? And J Japanese banks. Uh, I've had them, they're the, the top of my outperform list in the mo in the Belkin report for J Japanese sectors. Um, so there's stuff like that going on. It's also over there mining, non-ferrous metals, things that are China related. So I don't see the Japanese market falling apart and the, <clears throat> the sector rotation is still positive in a cyclical development direction. But um, so kind of non-committal, the, the index itself, like I said before, I just don't think indexes except for China are necessarily the place to be for this. It's more like the, the, the sectors are where the real opportunities are uh, in Japan as well as in the U.S. Thanks for that. Yeah, everything you speak of is suggestive of a reflationary flavor. 
Um, so just as, you know, from much of last year, um, well, until the, uh, well, going back a couple of years ago, energy killed tech, then tech killed energy, and now it's going back the other way. So it's like a swing from one extreme to the other. So I think you're right. The story is not so much the index level, but the sectoral level and group level. Uh, KFAB, good to see you. Um, got a question for Michael. Please unmute yourself. Hey, George. Yeah, thanks. Um, always a big fan when Michael um, is willing to to speak to everybody in these spaces. I've uh, been a longtime admirer, about 20 years. So um, when I disagree with him, I like to stress test <laughs> uh, what my process is saying, uh, because I, I go about things quite differently than, than he does, even though I um, immensely respect what he's built as far as a process. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of think of your process over the years as like a regression. I mean, a very sophisticated regression, but um, in that neighborhood. Um, so, and, and I think your, your, what you described in Q2 with this kind of crazy move in AI and the big seven um, and the model, you know, not capturing that would make sense relative to regression. Uh, so w when you've had issues with the model with extended periods or maybe missing, um, you know, outlier events like that kind of move. Um, the, like when you back test and back tested it when you built it and through the years, what are kind of, are there, is there any kind of consistency through time that you've seen where, you know, it, the model tends to have more vulnerability to some of these outlier events? Uh, good question. I, I've had that, had to feel that one a couple of times lately, obviously saying, why were you wrong? <laughs> uh, uh, so um, I'm, I'm thinking quantitatively now where, yeah, sometimes um, really runaway markets one way or the other can go further. The models, again, picking inflection points, right? So it's like you call it regression, maybe mean, re mean reversion. Some people say it's like that. It's not really, and it, conceptually it might be, but that's not the the mathematical principles of the model. But um, it is in this process of picking highs and lows in, in indexes, also in all these relative value things. And generally, it's more um, reliable on the sector rotation. So I'd say like maybe when the indexes run away one way, one direction or the other, um, uh, so there, there have been times, obviously, I'm not 100% right. I can remember times 2012 where things uh, went further and I felt like an idiot for a few months or so. But um, get, to get back to your idea, though, again, this um, it, it, everything changed in June. Okay, so look at a, if you do a ratio of New York FANG plus index or anything like that, FNGU, that's the... the uh, three times leverage DTF on that up to the S&P, you'll see there hasn't been any progress in this stuff. So in, in, in relative terms, so a little bit higher, a little bit lower. Um, and, but how long is that now? When it's like we're end of July, right? So four weeks, six weeks, six, eight weeks, uh, at least ballpark where uh, to me, it seems like something is on autopilot and I, I don't know, I don't have any insight on who is doing this, I, but I think some of it is automated, right? So the the uh, citadels of the world, the people who are running AI trading things, front, basically front running people. So you've got retail, who are the participants? Retail investors, who can really take things too far, you know, one way or the other. And you've got hedge funds who are kind of lagging, you know, for the most part, they're not ahead, at the head, they're not kind of leading trends so much anymore in, in aggregate. I'm, I'm not speaking in, in anybody in particular. And then you've got long only portfolio managers, you know, the huge, 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 huge places. And um, so I think there's kind of a crowding and sometimes the crowding can go further than the model anticipates on the one hand. But let me say some of the model's best calls and 30 something years of doing this have been when everybody's on one side of a trade and it reverses. So I saw that at the beginning, when I started out, Belkin Report was in 1992, hedge fund mafia were my clients, right? You know, 
the Tigers of the world, you know, Steinhardt's, all those kind of people. And I would see these guys, I thought, I thought to myself, oh, I'm such a great, you know, I'm the advisor, I have the biggest investors in the world and my clients. And then the more I saw how they trade, these guys at extremes, this is sort of an answer to your question, I would always see these guys, instead of buy low and sell high, they're always cramming into shit at the end and pushing it, pushing it, pushing it up, pushing it down. So like 1993, they're all long bonds. I don't know, this goes back, this might be before a lot of people's time, but there was a big bond rally. And then the Fed raises interest rates, starts raising 1994. They get killed, you know, Cooperman, God bless him. Uh, you know, I love him, but he was left holding the bag, holding like a big percentage of the Swedish bond market. So over time, I've seen this crowding and the crowding can take things further, but when it reverses, look out below because that's when you get the big moves where everybody's overweight something and it goes in the opposite direction. So yeah, model can be wrong. <clears throat> and when things get crowded and they push further, but for, for, uh, for some reason, I don't know why the, uh, that the sentiment gets so extreme. Why would people buy something after it's gone up? Like, look at the rate, yeah. look at the FANG stocks. They've gone up so ridiculously far. Why would you want to buy them up here? Hello? Is there ever heard well, of buy low so that's, high? That's, yeah, that's the mania. Um, so what? So y your answer offered some fertile ground for me to explore, if that's okay. So um, when you've seen these offsides, because again, obviously the the tech versus energy thing is a, a pretty clear example of that right now. When you've had these kinds where smart money is kind of desperate and following and chasing and FOMO and all this stuff, career risk, all these kind of frenzied environments, um, has it been absolute calls that have been more successful or relative? Meaning that it, it, it is, has it been riskier to go like absolute long energy when that hits or is it actually, is, is it a better risk reward to say, hey, you know, th it's the spread trade that's the slam dunk here um, when, when you get into these kind of really skewed offsides environments? Because that's what I, I focus on more tail, more, you know, um, my process is built towards looking for. Um, when the sand pile is going to collapse, <laughs> um, which doesn't happen very often, obviously. Um, so my, my, you know, my process has been pointing towards kind of Q3 and Q4 of this year as a likely very dangerous window. Um, and we're here now, and I'm actually starting to see stuff that makes me even like confirmation wise more worried. So that's when I hear stuff that like you're saying, I'm like, you know, can, can they coexist uh, and still be like a smart version of, of, um, risk reward relative to what your model is saying. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I don't have a super clear answer to that. Um, I'd say generally the model is is best at sector rotation, and um, it does not see. So right now, it's really the the index forecast is really um, it's really stretched in two directions. So the like I said that we're kind of in maybe indexes up another couple months, you know, uh, August, sometime into September, October. The indexes, if I just was pl an index player, I'd kind of leak, like be, uh, say, long, kind of a week w long looking, you know, f w a hold, not a buy, you know, for indexes. But when I go through on the weekend, on the, I, I, and I go through on individual groups and stocks, I just see all these stocks that want to go up that haven't gone up yet, right? So it's a really diverse, it's really, I, I don't, can't think of the right word. It's a really f uh, completely split, split personality market where the stuff- Yeah, dispers dispersion's been completely whacked out the last two months. It's gone completely berserk. Yeah. So I, it just looks like there's more room for these stocks. The stocks are looking for an excuse to go up. And there's this great rotation, again, the title of this space is. So I think that that by itself is going to keep the indexes up for a while while you get this divergence. So again, I kind of answered your question in a roundabout way before where I think um, yep. there, there can be this divergence where tech starts going down Technicians get spooked saying, oh, the market's all over. It can't go up because tech's going down. And yet the indexes lurch higher, led by this stuff that nobody likes and nobody owns. And so the fear of, fear of missing out goes from fear of losing out, F -O, FOLO in right. tech, fear of losing, not out, fear of losing, F-O-L in tech, to fear of missing out and all the other stuff. And the, so the indexes kind of 
do, you know, I, I, this is not really a super bullish scenario for the indexes, but it is yeah. like, you look at China, you know, eight, 10, up 8% this week. So there, there, there are these opportunities for sectors and groups yeah. and even global. And I, that, that's where I'm in 100% agreement with you, meaning that I think there's, again, my process that aligns with what you're saying is more on the spread side rather than on the absolute directional side. Um, if, if you'll indulge me, then I had one other question, because the other main thing that I, my process disagrees with what you're saying and uh, re relates to uh, the business cycle and the economy. So do you, do, do you apply your model to kind of specific silos of um, the business cycle? Like, are you doing... Uh, your model on GDI, on real retail sales, on manufacturing, on industrial production, on wholesale sales, like the like the, the stuff that the NBER will look at to look at and eventually, you know, when they do date um, business cycles, do you run it? Because I, 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 I don't do what you do, but I do something probably a very distant, much less sophisticated cousin. And um, what I'm doing, I mean, the rates of change are pretty clearly you know, the thing that's not doing it is GDP, but that's not unusual. Um, but, you know, they're, they're starting last fall, like, and I, again, I, I see it through the lens of like a sand pile, like the feedback loop of these things with rates of change and starting to interlock with each other really started kicking off late last year. And it's nothing's really changed since then. So that's why I was wondering if you run it, your model for some of these kind of siloed aspects of, of the business cycle. Um, yeah, actually, I talked about that earlier. So to me, the best um, indicators, some some of those, first of all, you don't even, they don't even get the reports until like a month or two later, right? So they're still reporting June data, you know, in, in many cases. The only timely ones that you get in terms of hard, or I guess they're soft, but um, are, are the PMIs and ISMs. And like I said earlier, I have ISM manufacturing and PMI, the um, the other one that manufacturing, you know, there's ISM one and the other one. I've got those bottoming. Really counterintuitive, right? I don't, I, I wouldn't, you know, if I hadn't seen that with the model forecast, I would say, I don't see that. A lot of stuff, industrial production, capacity utilization. Yeah, I, I apply that model to all that stuff. It looks that great. Retail sales, it's just kind of hanging in there. But, um, it, I, it looks to me like there could be a, a cyclical jump. Not, I'm not forecasting a boom or anything like that, but just from a depressed level, some kind of a little bounce. And it feeds into the investment strategy, tab, which is saying China is going to come back. So China's buying energy, China's buying base. Buying copper, China's buying wheat, China's buying copper, China's corn, you know, soybeans, blah blah blah. It's, you know, um, it look somewhat better over the last few months until energy. So this this strategy is happening. How are the pieces of the puzzle fit together? If entered, if crude price is now like seventy bucks, right, goes up to eighty, ninety, or hundred, then. Are off, right? That will that will pour a bucket of ice water on everything. So I, that's my general, like you said, seeing through, through the fog kind of a, a view. I think if the energy thing is out as it's supposed to, that energy costs and that's it, 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 it might be it might, Hey, Michael, yeah. you're breaking up again. I'm sorry, Michael, you're breaking up. Okay, so energy, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, that uh, temperamental phone here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so energy. Generally, I think um, some of this stuff could recover. Uh, you know, nobody's. You see anybody calling for a move up in the ISM manufacturing index? I got to be the only one seeing that. that I've seen anywhere, and I read. I didn't even get into what I do. Part of the Belkin report is all these stories I read. You know, all these sources every day, the New York Times, Financial Times, Washington, you know, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, all these things. And I'm stuck. You know, what's, what is the, what I, not, not, I'm not trying to reinforce my own biases. I'm saying, what is changing out there? What, and so, I, anyways, I'm a keen student of what the, what the news stories are saying. I don't see anybody saying manufacturing is going to rebound. 
you know, that's just not out there. But I see it in yeah, the model yeah, forecast. My, 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 my. Yeah, Michael, let me yeah. ask you a question apropos of that. Um, what are you, what is your model saying now in forward earnings estimates? Uh, it, it doesn't look great. It's again, just kind of coasting. Um, I, I think it's going to take uh, a decline in the economy to really knock earnings down, right? So no, no right. strong signals there. I think um, you, we've seen a return of speculation that kind of gets into margin debt too, uh, although they don't seem uncorrelated, but it has to do with confident earnings and confidence in margin debt. Margin debt has bounced back a little bit. So I think we could, basically I would call it a head fake. So we say like we get a head fake where the economy looks stronger, earnings are okay for this quarter, and then energy price goes up 20%, and it kills everything um, later this year. And then, so then it's a whole completely different scenario. And so, uh, you know, my crystal ball is not 100%, but I, that's the general kind of loosey goosey scenario. Yeah, no, uh, up that, for now. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. One other question that uh, someone sent in um, I know you're talking, you're, you, you have different cycles, and generally you've been talking over the next few months, you're expecting to see. And, and maybe you'll say your confidence level looking at much further is lower, but um, generally where can you see things being a year from now, whether it's uh, a sector or an index or the economy overall, um, and maybe you don't want to go there, but would you hazard a guess of what, where things could look a year from now, let's say? Uh, I hate to because um, it's not that clear, really. Long-term is not good. And I think, I think we have artificial stimulus in fiscal stimulus in the U.S., which I mentioned that nobody's, I'm the only one talking about that. Government spending up smooth, up, you know, 15% or something year over year. So it's pushing like crazy. So we've got this artificial boom and I kind of think they blew their wad. So basically they want to get reelected, although now they're even saying Biden might not be the candidate, but they want, anyways, they don't want the economy to look bad for the next election, right? The incumbents whoever that, that candidate might be. But I think they, got, you know, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes, right? I think they're going to be out of ammo. <laughs> so um, this will be interesting. I think so politics kind of feeds into this. Again, I'm ambivalent. I don't, you know, I, like I said earlier, sure. I hate all politicians. Usually the, I hate the ones that are in power, usually more than the ones that are out of power. But, yeah, but uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so I think... Uh, it, it's next year is going to be difficult because they they've basically they've they've inflated they've they've done this artificial boom they've artificially depressed the oil price they can't do it anymore oil prices are going to rise they won't be able to keep doing fiscal expansion the fed's going to keep raising interest rates so my hunch is without any hard forecast you know but just my investment strategist hat next year is going to look a lot different than this year it's going to be more difficult Makes sense. All right. Final questioner. We've got um, Jeffrey coming up. Uh, Jeffrey, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. Yes. Br brilliant yourself. space, Go George. For. Michael, I, I love everything you're talking about. I just got a question um, as far as the uh, metals um, with Brazil. Do you have a, a thought on EWZ Brazil? Uh, I think they're going to start to lower their interest rates. Right. And then, um, you know, in EWZ, uh, uh, valets is, is probably the, the 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 largest position. So just just curious your thoughts on Brazil, the emerging markets, and and, and of course you know the the miners. Thanks. Michael, please unmute yourself. Okay, sorry about that. Got got lost in my phone here. Um, actually, I, I thank you for bringing that up. If anybody's still here, you know, on, on this space. Really, you have, you have 700 people listening to you still. Going. Yep. Okay, emerging yeah. markets really like them, and I like Latin America. Now, Brazil, uh, less so than some of these others. So, Peru, big resources play. I think, uh, I don't know, is there an XLP? <laughs> I don't know, XLP Peru, whatever. Like, Peru plays. Uh, one is, uh, there's a silver mining stock, Buena Ventura, BVN. Um, I don't, I'm, the, the, the gold and silver stocks are close to becoming a buy. A few of them are, they're just rotating still. So it's a, it's one of the preview of coming attractions, precious metals coming, not there yet, just beginning to be there on some of them. But, um, so to give you 
a more specific answer. Here's the way I had them ranked <clears throat> last week. Uh, you know, and the order kind of bounces around. It changes from, from week to week. But from top, most confident to least confident, longs, EM. Peru, Colombia, Chile, Kuwait, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, South Africa, China, UAE, and then Brazil's kind of down there below those. So, yeah, I like emerging markets, and um, Brazil is not the top of my list. I, I understand what you're saying. The interest rates are really high, and they're probably going to be lowered. That could be a boost. So that could change the order. Um, by the way, uh, while we're, here's a little slight digression on that. Um, frontier markets. Not a big position for anybody, but if you're a retail investor, you, you, these are sort of barometer of what's going on out there. And there's some really nice depression out there. Um, it's not so much before. Um, Pakistan, <laughs> Sri Lanka. See if you can get charts on some of these because they, if you have to buy low, um, and of course, the demographics and everything in, in frontier markets, Kenya, places like that, Pakistan, I mean, there's huge positives on, uh, on economy, I mean, you know, the way younger population growth and every, all that kind of stuff. So l love emerging markets and frontier markets at the moment. Again, that keeps me from being bared up on the world uh, on, this, on stock indexes because there's just they, these things look like they could rally. So China, of course, is in there in, in emerging markets. China going up is going to drag the indexes up and, and increase investment flows into other depressed emerging and frontier markets. So yeah, I'm with you on Brazil, although it's not the top of my list, but thank you for bringing up, uh, I should have mentioned uh, being bullish on fr uh, EM and FM earlier. Yeah, you, you, Michael, what, what about Korea and Mexico? They're not necessarily emerging markets, but what do you think of those two? Not my favorite. Uh, so okay. uh, Mexico's up huge. It's, it's kind of a, uh, it's sort of a hold. Uh, Korea yep. is a tech market, right? Korea right. and Taiwan are not longs for me. Okay, Got so it's it. kind of like the, the same idea. You don't want to be in tech. If you don't want to be in tech, you don't want to be in Korea and Taiwan. Right. Last question, because uh, I don't see any others. Um, unless Michael Kramer wants to come up and say something. Um, and that is, you know, we're talking about spread trades. You and KFA were talking at length about spread trades. And your model is good at the sector rotation. Sometimes, not, not, all, not all convictions are equal. Sometimes you really got more conviction on the longs versus the shorts. And I don't mean to read between the lines, but as I read your report and I see the plethora of, uh, of, 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 of buy ideas and I listen to your explanation and then looking at the shorts, um, you know, let's say it's pick on tech, which is the apple of your on the short side. It hasn't gone down very much. It hasn't kept up, but it's all a long way from forming the question, which is you have more feel better about your long calls right here or your short calls? Obviously you got the spread on, but which one do you think is a better pitch to switch if, if, if you had to pick one side? Longs. <laughs> Very right. simple one, one word answer. And energy, banks, metals and mining, agriculture, you know, retail sure. stocks. Uh, but okay, so w one quick uh, uh, digression there. So if we get into this... Uh, market with divergences, okay, where tech starts underperforming. What I expect to happen is to see some of these groups. So like if you look at page six of the other Belkin report this week, the the long side, the longs are on the left, the shorts are on the right, and the longs are like two or three times as long as the right in terms of number of groups and, and stocks. So um, I would expect to see some of those begin to poop out. Okay. And it, it did happen this week with airlines. So kind of a gradual process where the longs um, begin to, they flame out, okay? So uh, airlines, which were, was a top, airlines were a top outperform recommendation maybe two months ago and had a huge rally. All of a sudden, they're kind of pooping out, right? So um, that's just one group though so far. So I would expect to see that. I, I haven't, you know, I haven't done the work yet. I do the work on the weekends, but um, I'm still... I'm not seeing groups sit, saying getting removed. So that's at the top of the page six that's removed this week. So I uh, see this process where cyclicals begin to, they go up a lot. They, they stall out. They begin to roll over. 
then it turns into sh the advantages to the shorts. So I think it's really hard for the shorts right now, no, no question about it. Um, but that could change. Let, let's see what happens with the, with the FANG stocks. I'm looking personally, I'm waiting to put uh, a short on on the group of FANG stocks. I don't have it on right now. I'm, I'm just waiting, you know, maybe another day or two. So personal, personal account, I'm probably going to be shorting FANG stocks soon. Got it. And by the way, Michael, I say this too affectionately, not 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 to criticize you, but someone tweeted out. <laughs> I think it's a very good suggestion because this isn't the first time you've had trouble with your telephone. They said, "Can we start a GoFundMe page for Michael to get a satellite phone, dude? You got to <laughs> do something about this connection." <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> a GoFundMe page, I love it. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for hanging in there. This has been a great space. Uh, Mike will do this again, hopefully, in the future. And um, hopefully everyone's, uh, you know, found this very informative. So thanks again, Michael, for all you do. And, again, reach out. If anyone's interested, reach out, reach out to uh, at Hyperpyron um, to learn more about the Belkin Report. So take care, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, George. Bye-bye.